The Drum Candy Podcast is brought to you by Drum Factory Direct. Welcome into episode 11 of season 5 of the Drum Candy Podcast. This is your host, Mike Dawson, coming to you from Drum Factory Direct in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This week we have a guest host, Thomas Went is back, and he is interviewing the great Philadelphia-based jazz drummer Byron Landham. Byron has been a staple on the modern jazz scene since the 1990s, and some of his credits include the late great Betty Carter, George Coleman, Bobby Hutcherson, Joey Dave Francesco, Frank West, Pat Martino, Cyrus Chestnut, Russell Malone, and many, many more. He also has his own band, and he is on faculty at Temple University. So I'm going to just hand it over to Thomas. So enjoy this chat with Thomas Went and Byron Landham. All right, we'd like to welcome everybody to another edition of the Drum Candy Podcast. Such a pleasure to be here hosting, again, guest hosting, and uh, very, very honored to be talking with one of the uh, the great modern masters of our time. This is take two. <laughs> We're very welcome, very, very honored to be welcoming the great Byron Landon. Master Landon, thank you for, for being with us today again, man. We appreciate it. Brother, always my pleasure. Yeah, thank you, man. So, you know, it, I, I've, I've been looking forward to this because um, you are one of the uh, the great sons of, uh, of Philadelphia, and I'm over on the other side of the state in uh, in Pittsburgh. And both of our cities, I, I, I always say uh, both Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and Detroit are really, really essential cities for, for jazz music because so many people came out of all these cities. And you you came up in in philadelphia's great uh, uh jazz legacy man so why don't we why don't we kind of start there how did you how did you come to the drums and then how did you come to to jazz music well you know i have a, an old, older brother who's a, a saxophone his name's robert land and actually he's a, a classical clarinetist as well mm -hmm. but uh you know he's about six years older than me and uh, his thing getting into the saxophone and uh, playing music, like he was actually turned on by a friend of my father's. Uh, his name is Paul Finney. He turned my brother on to all these like Brown and Max Rouge records and Art Blakey records, Maynard Ferguson. It was like all these different kinds of like ensemble, like sextet or more bands. Mm -hmm. And my brother, you know, I, when I started playing, I started. I was kind of interested in R and B. I guess I was about seven years old, and I kept, you know, I came up with what I was, you know, during my time, Stevie Wonder, you know, Gladys Knight, and all that. So, I think that those records changed me and my brother's life from then on. I, I think I was maybe about eight or nine years old, and we got these records, and it was like Max Roach and Clifford Brown, and that was, you know, we heard that and it was. I kind of like shifted my gear to right away trying to learn how to play swing and play, you know, with these ensembles. And I, I dug it because it was like, you know, the, the freedom that it had. I mean, it was discipline, but it was a little more freedom to, to showcase, you know, the instrumentalists. You know. Mm, interesting. Wow, that's, that's it's I'm sorry, though totally. Yeah, yeah. So, so when 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 ap after you sort of uh, discovered. Uh, jazz music by way of of R and B and whatnot. What were some of your earliest experiences as far as as playing the music? How did you sort of come to play the music at first? Well, you know, for a long time, uh, I was basically home because I was so young, and it's like in this city, and from my brother and from musicians that I had known, like maybe older than me, because I, I attended all these music camps. It was always a high standard, so I was very afraid at a young age to like go and I wanted to make sure before I sat in with anybody that I could really play play the music and understand it to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that once I got to be about fourteen, I remember doing like playing with some of the older musicians in town, and I think Joey D. Francesco was on it. He's younger than me, but we were both doing a recording on the jazz, main jazz station here in Philadelphia with that with some older musicians. And it was like, from then, I think I was, yeah, I was 14 and he was 13 or 12 or whatever. And that kind of gave me a lift in terms of knowing, oh, I can do this. And I'm very, I want to do this because it was so intriguing to me as just something I could never get away from once I started doing it. Mm-hmm. 
Wow. So was was that WRTI then back then? Absolutely. Yeah, that's it's, it's one of the great great jazz stations. So could you talk a little bit about what what the Philadelphia scene was like for you back then when you started playing? What were some of your early experiences uh, in in Philadelphia that that sort of were were important in your development? Maybe. It's a good question. You know, actually, like uh, I think I started to become a become a fixture on the scene at a young age. I think I was about. 17, 16, 16, actually. Mm-hmm. I, uh, my brother and I had a band uh, at that time, and it was basically under his name, and it had uh, we, we featured Christian McBride and Eduardo Simon. And I remember us playing a gig at a place in Philly called The Painted Bride. And I did that gig, and a couple of drummers that were well-known drummers, in, 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 especially in Philly, Greg McDonald and uh, Webb Thomas, Oh yeah, they were both. I know Greg McDonald was working with Bo- a great saxophonist named Bootsy Barnes, and Webb Thomas was working with a bassist named Charles Fambro. So after that gig, I got to meet Greg McDonald, and he was really talking to a bunch of people around the city, trying to just hook me up with work. And it happened like that way that I met Bootsy Barnes, and was doing a, working with Bootsy when I was sixteen. Mm-hmm. And I started working with a guitarist named on that summer, too. Great guitarist. He passed away maybe about a year ago. And uh, it was the same vibe. It was just through the spread of, you know, the word, this young guy is around. He's playing drums really decent, and he knows some, some of the music. And uh, once I worked with Bootsy, it was like, okay, you know, because I was 60, I was really green. I mean, I had good facility, and I had a good understanding of the music, but... You know, I get there with him and he's, you know, I had my sticks in my back pocket, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Where's your mallets? This is, this is a bolero. Where's your mallets? Said, mallets? What's mallet? You, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> it was, it was, that was a growing experience. And also working with uh, Monette and Charles. Charles was hardcore. You know, you had, it was either sink or swim. You know, mm-hmm. you, you have to really play and you needed to know some basic tunes and be able to feel your way through a song form if somebody was doing something strange with the harmony or the rhythm, you know. And that kept spreading around, and by the time I was 17, I got a call from this guy named Pete Souders. It was the owner of a place called Ortlieb's Jazz House in Philadelphia, which is a club I've been associated with for many, many years. And I know that most of the jazz musicians who were real prominent during that time and even 20 years before that, like uh, Shirley Scott and Trudy Pitts, Mickey Roker, Arthur Harper, all these people. And he actually said to man, I'd like you to come down and play. And I came down and I sat in and I played. And uh, he hired me at a, a great bassist by the name of Mike Boone and a great pianist by the name of Sid Simmons to become like a house rhythm section on Tuesdays. Mm-hmm. And that was really unique for me because you had all kinds of people any given day. You know, might, George Benson might come or Terrence Blanchard. And we had some great artists here like uh, Evelyn Sims. You know, and then I started playing it. Sometimes I was even working with, uh, with Shirley Scott and Arthur Harper, which was frightening for me because, you know, they had a way of playing. It was just overwhelming for me in a sense. And Shirley would be was one to tell if things weren't right, she'd say, Don't play, just listen, you know. And I'm seventeen. Okay. <laughs> Those were great. She said, and once I started to listen, I began to understand some concepts about how people approach their music and that you have to be flexible to work with anybody, you know. Mm-hmm. That's that's the thing. That's been the, the biggest learning experience for me is just being able to be in Philadelphia, you know being able to be around all these great musicians and really like they suggest things to you. Like that was most of my learning. It was word of mouth. It was a grassroots kind of thing. I'm sure you too, you know, absolutely. And you no, know, there was that and just intense study and always willing to learn and listen It's best if you keep your ears open and your mouth shut sometimes. Yeah, no, that that's, that's, I think that's one of the most important things you could say. And it's, it's something that's missing today because there's all this, and I'm not knocking the technology. I mean, we're using it right now. It's wonderful, but there's something about someone 
giving you a small piece of information and then you having to figure out the rest. There's something in that that I think is really important. Do you, would, would you agree? Absolutely. That, that's what it's about. Nothing's, nothing's supposed to be uh, like when you put together a puzzle. Nothing's easy. It's going to take time. You've got to find a piece over here, and that goes with this piece there. It takes time. And the grassroots thing is special because, you know, we're used to social media and things like that, texting and, you know, living behind a word that we see. Mm -hmm. But when you're sitting in front of, uh, you know, a, a Mickey Roker or Bobby Dorham or Billy James or Edgar Bateman or mm. Butch Ballard, or, <laughs> and these people are looking you, you looking you in the eye. And tell you say maybe make do this or maybe not do that or maybe think about this. You know that's what's important. And them telling you how they dealt with adversity and and during their careers and stuff like that. That's that's important. That's what's really going to make you. You know. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 it, man. And it's it's such a man. I mean, for 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 myself, you know, to to get into this music and just happen to be from Pittsburgh, it was like. That's like striking gold, you know, same in Philadelphia. You're you're right in this city that has all of this right there that you can, you know, partake of, which is which is really special about about Philly and Pittsburgh. So let's 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 pause for just a second on on the on the on the jazz scene front. Tell talk a little bit about what you were working on when you were younger as a drummer, when you were practicing, like when you were 17, 18, when you were just getting on the scene and working with some of these, these older musicians, what were some of the things that you were practicing and what are some of the things that you felt like really were, were important in your development that you were working on at that time? Right. Well, well, you know, as, as kids do, um, of course, I was influenced by the people that were important to me that I was listening to musically at the time. And it was when I was 16, 17, a lot of it was Tony Williams and a lot of it was, uh, you know, uh, Steve Gadd. I was like a big fan of Chick Corea and a lot of those groups. A lot of it was, you know, Harvey Mason and Headhunters. It was all these things. So I was naturally attracted to that. And I was a big fan of Weather Report. So I was into all this fusion music. But a lot of those guys were my forefront. And it was, um, you know, it was basically for me, a lot of my, I, I've always had naturally good technique. So, and, and sometimes I, I think that might be a detriment to some people's development. <laughs> because it's, it's more important to learn how to express yourself with a little bit, as opposed to just going all in right away. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, a lot of my experience or a lot of my growth I was really like just like really working on technical stuff and working on being able to play really fast, you know, and uh, really working on ensemble play and being able to, like Art Blakey is a master of this, like being able to set up figures for melody. That's, mm -hmm. that's really, those things were important to me. And of course, you know, as drummers, like you know, we're always worried about our time. You know, worry about playing good time because if you have good time and good taste, that's you know that you're 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 always at uh, almost at the top of the hill. With that. Mm -hmm. These things were real important. Technically, I was just I, I had a good swing feel, and I was I always had good hands or whatever I could use my feet, and that was cool. I think the the greatest thing for me was working with people that were older than me, having that opportunity. And then really focusing on me being disciplined because I wanted to, you know, when you, you want to do everything that you can, it's about really the, the, the more that you try to sound like above your, above your years and the more that you learn how those older cats really apply, use, use their fundamentals and their ears to, you know, support the music. That's the best thing. Lucy Barnes is probably the best for me with that. And my brother just kind of tr constantly trying to keep me involved in the music and paying attention to the younger musicians that were coming up or people that were around, you know, my peers yep. and people above. So for me, it was just, a. I think the, that for me, during that time, my greatest, uh, the greatest thing that helped me learn more was the experience I had dealing with older musicians who were really focused on me being more disciplined and knowing when not to play so much, knowing when to, you know, work on dynamics, that kind of thing. And the sooner you get to do that, 
in your career. If you're a young guy, if you can sound older, the better for you. So it took me, and I'm still, I teach that to this day. I teach that, and I swear by it. If I feel strange with my playing now, it's always go back to fundamentals. Good time, good taste, dynamics, you know, technical stuff. We can all come up with something about that, you know, but it's really those those other intangibles that are important. What, what you bring to the music from a minimal standpoint, but a strong feeling. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. When when you say that, you know, you, you, you kind of always had good, good technique, were you working on like rudimental stuff? Did you have a teacher that showed you that at first or? Absolutely. Like, like I have, uh, I had a mentor. His name is uh, Kevin Outerbridge. He's a great drummer. And he, uh, he's actually a little bit younger than my brother. And we came up together in Philly because it was, they had all these music camps. So I met all these drummers. And at that time, you know, I, I had a lack of control with single stroke rolls. And, you know, I would tense up and, and this thing was, it's supposed to be easy. You know, I can always play power diddles really well and, and double stroke rolls, but it took me some time to develop a single stroke roll. Those were things I was really interested on in terms of like developing chops to play around the drums was a single stroke roll, finding different patterns to play double stroke roll, power diddle, flam taps, things like that, flam accents, mm -hmm. you know, I, and I was so concerned with developing a certain amount of control with the bass drum, oh. being able to do some of the things uh, Tony Williams used to do, and I still can't do them actually, but those were a <laughs> lot of my- alone. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I mean, it was, it, was, it was feel and it was like me, and here's what I think is important with my playing now, some of the things, and I always talk about this, trying to find little, uh, little nuances or little fills or little things that basically set the music up. And in short, in a short amount of time, whether it be a two, a two beat fill or nuance or a four beat, something like that, even if it's a press roll or things, I've always tried to do that work, little things into my playing for breaks or for trading or for just comping. And a lot of that is five stroke rolls, six stroke rolls, you know, so I was really trying to do that. And still to this day, I think if the, when you find phrases that are, are shorter, that works better for you. Because everybody can go, <laughs> you know, it's, it's playing the, the, the right thing in the right spot. And sometimes that could be a minimal thing or it could be a big thing. But yeah. focusing on the, the small little things, roughs and, and uh, you know, double drag. It's a lot of the Philly stuff, too. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's basically where I was coming from technically, you know, but still immature. So people would really stress to me, it's more about the color of your notes mm. and not the notes themselves. So that's, wow. you know. Yeah, man, that's, yeah, that's all, that's all great information. So as, as you were, as you were getting into the Philadelphia scene as a, as a younger man and, and playing with, with, with older musicians, were you playing in in a lot of different types of jazz settings, or was it mostly like mostly small group stuff, or were you doing some different things? And if so, what what were those? It was uh, no, it was mostly small set. I would say a lot of the things I did was uh, like between trio and sextet, no more than sextet. I didn't really do big band stuff a lot when I was a, a, a kid. Uh, and even till this day, I've done small, not not a whole lot of big band stuff. But mm -hmm. um, it was mainly, I would say more more than anything, it was trios and quartets. Cool. This is pretty much where I cut my teeth, and that was good. I, I always preferred that because of the space. I like you know I, I like the space, and I like to be able to contribute or or have more of a rapport. You know, I always felt it, it was a, it, for me, it's interesting. I think you have a more of a rapport when you have less musicians. I mean, everybody has their role, but it's easy to get more into a dialogue, you know, mm -hmm. when it's just with, with musicians. Yeah. So it, it was that with smaller groups, and, and I, you know, I dig that. I actually yeah. dig that. Yeah, absolutely. So during this time when you're when you're getting out there as a younger a younger person, who were some of the who were some of the first 
um, sort of national or international artists that you worked with. And if you could talk about anything that, that, that you learned specifically from those people as a younger musician uh, working with them, because I know from, you know, in my experience, being a younger person and being on stage with someone who's really kind of big is is a lot different than playing with guys that you work with a lot, you know, in the city, even when they're great musicians. That's like a different kind of experience. So could you talk a little bit about that? That's, and that's a good point. You bring that up, too. And here's the thing, because I was young, it's, you know, it's easy to take that for granted when you have a chance to work with uh you know, some people that have been there and done that for so long. But, you know, as you know, and a lot of people know, I worked with Joey DeFrancesco for many years, and, and we were both young and we kind of grew up together playing. So a lot of the um, things that kind of branched me out from that was through playing with him when other artists got to hear me. You know, um, I remember working in Mexico, and I met a guy named George Robert, who was, uh, who was from Switzerland. And uh, one of the first gigs I did outside, I think I might have been 19, I wasn't quite 20 yet. It was uh, with Tom Harrell. He told me that was one of the things that intrigued me, was Tom Harrell. And it was a great bassist, Reggie Johnson, and a great pianist, Donald Maroney. Mm. And I met this guy in, you know, in Mexico, and then that branched out to something else. And before I know it, I'm doing a, a live record with uh, a bunch of saxophones, like the uh, Houston person. Uh, Grover Washington Jr., Illinois Jaquette, who was, you know, wow. <laughs> Illinois, so I had all these guys, Kirk Willem, I had all these guys, wow. different genres, different, you know, different, uh, you know, pure, different eras, pretty much, you know, all in the same gang. And that just kept branching me out. Before I knew it, I got a call from, from Betty Carter. And I worked with Betty Carter for a couple of years, and that was, you know, that, that's a lot to learn there because you're going to learn more about the delicate side of music, being able to play ballads with more space. And that was yep. a big thing with dynamics, being able to go from a whisper to a roar, any tempo, you know. And that led, that started leading to more people. So it leading to, like, Stanley, um, Stanley Turn team called me. Mm -hmm. uh, I started working with Bobby Hutchison. Mm. And and getting other stuff, I did like some stuff with Dave Sanborn, with uh, Lee Rittenhauer. It just kind of branches out. I have worked recently with Cyrus Chestnut. I, you know, I do, and it's like it's so easy to forget how many people that you work. It's, it's, it's really important to document because mm -hmm. I work with those people that it's it's hard for me to remember them all at at the time that it happened. Sure, because life is so funny. But it's important to do that, you know. Uh, just having that and being able to go out. I've never worked with, I've worked with uh, John Patitucci a year ago. We recorded with uh, Chuck Lowe. That was, you know, just these, those experiences. And then you get something from each different experience and regardless of the, the genre or the type of music that it is, just hanging with different guys, that really makes you who you are, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah. And being open for that, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's definitely true. Well, why don't we why don't we take two of those artists and do kind of a compare and contrast? So let's why don't why don't you talk for a minute first about working with the great master Bobby Hutcherson, and then talk about how it was different working with Dave Sanborn because those are two great artists, but they're very very different. So could you kind of compare and contrast those two experiences? Absolutely. Like, uh, well, to compare them. I'm like, Bobby's in the league of... I know. <laughs> they both, both of them are in the league of their own. They both have... Uh, and, and the important thing to think about them is they both have their own voice. They have a very distinctive sound. And that's a lesson, lesson within itself because it's all about your sound. Your sound is what makes you who you are. And then, you know, Bobby... Bobby has this... Uh, this great spiritual vibe about it. I mean, him and I are both b believers. We, we're into faith. And, Bob, you know, it really comes through. He, he's like the, he's, he's so unusual. He's like, uh, I always say this about all musicians. We're all kind of, uh, I don't know, eccentric or, you know, we're all so alike and so different. Bobby is like one of the s sweetest men I've, I've ever met. I mean, he's like, 
he'll give you the shirt off his back. And he talks about stories, and it's like things that may have been in the past. He talks about them like it, it feels like it's present. Mm. And I always felt like I had this, uh, like Bobby was a, a uncle or a big brother or something like that. Because he always had, he liked being around people. And this, you know, this thing, he wanted to uh, comfort you and nurture you. And he said very little about the way, if he liked the way you play, he'd say, oh, man, that's, you know. Like he said to me, oh, man, that's like being in the crack of the whip. He would have these kinds of, like, you know, you played something and it made me think about eating pancakes, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's that kind of, but then I think learning, it's an experience because, you know, it's like you learn most from listening to his approach. Like, I remember playing with him, playing the blues. I think we might have been a blues enough or something like that, or kind of up there or take the cold train, something like that. And he's playing. And I think that that time it was just trio. It was me, him, and Joey DeFrancesco working in and put at the at the artist guild. Yeah. As a matter of fact. That was like the first gig I did with him. Wow. And uh he was playing we were playing the blues and he played and I noticed he played he built the solo up so incredible and then just walked up before the course was done. And after this, I said, man, you, you, I said, there's still some left in the court. He said, oh, but I was done. You know, <laughs> when you finish saying what you say, you leave whatever. You don't have, it doesn't have to be so, you know, it doesn't have to be so symmetric. Mm. And, you know, and then with Dave, this is another artist who's basically got this soul thing and this blues thing un incredible. His sound is his greatest attribute. Mm -hmm. You know, and his greatest contribution to the music, his, his sound and his feeling when he plays. But Dave is so structured. Like, Bobby is so asymmetri asymmetrical. And Bobby's, I mean, Bobby's asymmetrical, and Dave is symmetrical to the mm -hmm. point where it's like, okay, you got to make these certain figures within this tune right here because I need to hear this. Uh. But at the same time, the energy is going to be over the top, you know. And that's the thing. Bobby's thing, you know, you're gonna you're gonna start with that simmer and boil. Dave, you're gonna come right out from the gate like boiling. Mm. That 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 was the difference with those guys. But both of them had what I what I think they gave to me is a greater awareness still of feeling, the way you approach time, and the energy and the, what you bring to the mu music spiritually, how you connect with everybody. Mm. That's really wow, man. That's <laughs> It's so great to hear you talk about both of those guys who are who are so different, but as you said, they're both they're both such individual and singular artists just because of what they bring to the music. So when when you're in different situations, this is something um, I was listening a couple of weeks ago to a, a younger drummer here in Pittsburgh who was playing a gig and a very talented young guy, and I felt as though he was having a hard time connecting with the music via the other musicians who who are in the band obviously so my qu my my next question to you is if you're if you're in a situation where you're playing with musicians who you've not worked with before this could be at a jam session it could be on a gig anywhere what are some of the first things that you're doing in your mind and in your mind's ear to 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 find that connection quickly on stage, what what are some of the things you're listening for and doing? I know that might be a little strange, but I I don't know how else to word it right now. <laughs> That's a good way to put it because, and I I discuss this a lot because um, I think it's important for younger musicians to understand the most important thing is to develop some kind of rapport with the musicians you're working with, even if it feels uncomfortable because everybody has a different perception of time. And and harmony sometimes too. It seems like you know. Totally. It's like it's best to be. This is why we we study the music for so many years, because you have to develop a vocabulary to be able to be flexible enough to play wherever the vibe goes to. You know, and it doesn't matter. It can be the simplest thing or the most complex thing. You have to really un be able to listen and develop. My thing. I'm going to try to develop some kind of feel with the bass player right away. I got to hook up with the bass player. Yep. And then I got to have whoever's comping with me, whether it be piano or guitar, I got to have a dialogue with them, you know, but the time's got to feel good first. 
we all I have to create a foundation and, and me you know, Ray Brown said to me, I got a chance to record with Ray Brown once. He said and it, that was a big band situation, something I was very uncomfortable with doing. Wow. And it was all it was in it was in LA, it was at Capitol Studios. All these great musicians, wow. Conti Condoli and Shorty Rogers and Jack Mimmitz, Rick Ricky Water, all these wow. great Jack. All these Sinatra, Sinatra sessions. And, you know, I was a little bit of a wreck because I was in, a little bit uncomfortable with that vibe. But I said, okay, I just got to groove. Everything else will take care of itself, you know. And we get in there, we're kind of running over tune. And it felt like the, the, the horn section was playing way behind. And me and Ray were way on top of me. We got stopped. I said, man, we, you know, Ray was, was that course. And it felt like they were playing way behind. And he's, you know, he gave me a, you know, a phrase that I won't say the, the phrase, but it was like, you know, screw that, you know, we're gonna make them play with us, you know. They, they're gonna play. He said, don't, don't worry about, it. screw them, they're gonna play with us. Yeah. And that, that was a strong lesson to me. My thing is, always try to develop a rapport or some kind of vibe right away with the bass, whoever's really holding down that foundation of time, and let everybody play, make everybody play with you, but. Not from the sense of being selfish or sacrificing the music, because there's going to be some times where you have to, you know, the thing is never sacrifice the music, but try to make it as comfortable for everybody. And as a drummer, completely, be, it's, it's not about you at all. You have to, if you can play a good time and you have good taste, everything's going to follow. As long as you have good time and good taste, do that and then try to slowly develop your way into work, feeling whatever their, the players, whatever their tendencies are and their, however they go. But best thing is just develop that groove, get a chemistry with the band and try to let the music dictate to you. Don't, don't try to force your will on it because mm. you use stuff on the wrong side. No, that's man. I think I think that last thing you said, all of that was great. But the, the last thing you said, I think is, is really important of letting the music tell you what to do. And I think I think for younger musicians in particular, that can be that can be really difficult because they're, you know, they're anxious and they're nervous. And it takes a certain amount of relaxation to be able to say, okay, what what is this saying to me? What is what does this need from me right now? You know? Yeah. Exactly. Mentally strong with that, you know, because if you look at so much pressure on young musicians, especially in Western music, you know, so much pressure on us, oh you gotta be great and blah blah blah. So you can sometimes develop a sense of pride when you're trying to focus so much on being in the clip that you're not really focusing on playing music honestly from you know from the heart being genuine. Woo, man! I mean that <laughs> that that's something that I see a lot in younger musicians, and I'm not trying to put slam younger musicians. I love them, but it's just, it's more of right. it's it's more about helping, right? And it's there you you inevitably see younger players who they they could be very talented but they're it's more about the social aspect or more about like you said the click in the in the social group than like what are we actually here to do and i find that that you know as someone who's you know i've i've started to do teach more teaching in the last you know 8 or 10 years and in, in trying to sort of impart to younger musicians like that's all fine. The social aspect is part of it, but this is what we're here to do. You know, this this music is our focus, and I've, I I find, um, you know, that can be that can be challenging to sort of you know impart. I just do my best to try to just be an example by doing it, but it's it's challenging. Do you find the same with younger players? Absolutely, and when what you just said, that's all you could do is do your part and kind of you, you, because you know this this music is really big it's based on emotional content too so you know you can't teach anybody how to laugh or cry you can only influence you can they can only see what you do or how you do what you do and they have to understand that they have to find their own path in terms of their feelings and their emotions the way they apply that musically hmm. you know but for me i always deal with my students and i deal with anytime i teach or do master classes it's always talking about being musical because for so long so many years I I spent so much time into trying to okay how can I wow people how can I you know and I think a lot of young musicians you want people to to recognize you and albeit sometimes most of the time for the wrong reasons and I'm trust me and I love 
I love all the stuff. I'm just as wild as anybody else when I can see a, a young guy or anybody play so much stuff. But it's still up. You, you'll find out one day you'll end up playing with somebody, if you're fortunate, or somebody older, that you will get exposed for not really focusing on all the things that you thought were important, you know. Things you thought were important are usually not the most important things. Time yeah. and, t- and that's hard to teach because it's discipline. It's, it's experience. Yeah. You know, experience is going to be your best teacher, you know. No, absolutely. And also, time and taste to put it one way, is not very glamorous, you know? I think a lot of, I think a lot of younger players, they, they might know, like, yeah, it is really all about playing great time and grooving and everything, but, and this is where, you know, again, I'm not trying to knock the technology, but a lot of these younger players, they, they're on, you know, Instagram, and they'll see a 30-second video of someone playing, and they'll, they'll look at it and go, wow, that person's amazing. And not realizing, like, well, they might be amazing, but that might have been the 48th take that they did to try to get that 30 seconds to sound a certain way. <laughs> You're seeing just these very small snippets of things, which is totally different than sitting with someone like the great Butch Ballard or Mickey Roker for several hours, you know? Indeed. Indeed. They'll tell you, and a lot, that, that's what I miss. And... This is what I try to fulfill as a as now somebody I guess they would consider me an old old G or you know <laughs> a, a older statesman of the music and I know we, you and I we, we both look different than when we first met. Yes, sir, we do. <laughs> getting there, yep. but you know, important to you know, and I think about that. I, I really stress that on you. It's so important to really try to work on being patient with the music and developing a good sound and listen to these recordings and think about why did these men, why did our, our mentors and I, why did they play what they played? You know, that's the important, you gotta get into the music, you know, psychologically too. And from, you know, an emotional standpoint and, and not just think about what's going to make you sound good or what's the slickest thing to play with this. It's more yeah. about feeling that you can provide and is it, is a, a thing that's where it's uh, compatible to whatever the situation, you know, the, what's coming from each musician. Yeah. We have to be able to adapt and say things and be in a way and be out of the way at the same time, you know. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah, it is. It, it it is hard, and I think that's where that's where, as you said earlier, the 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 patience and the time factor. You know, you do have to put that time in. It's not you're not just a click away from it. You know, it's something that 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 demands that you spend the time in learning learning how to do it. So, man, yeah, that's that's some really important stuff. Um, there's other stuff we could talk about, but we'll 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 do that next time. I wanted to move on to. Um, an area of drumming and an area of jazz drumming that, that, that you're really great at. And that's with, of course, playing with organ players. And I wanted to, to get some of your thoughts about the differences between playing with a bassist and an organist and some of the things that you as a drummer are doing differently between those two, the, those two situations musically. Um, well, that's, that's a good question too. But I've gotten that a lot over, over some, some years now because i was been blessed to play with uh, a lot of those organists, a lot of the great organists of, of our time. Um, I've always, uh, you know, I, the strange thing about me is I never really approached playing with an organist any different as playing with the basses. Now, the thing where I'll say that, that you should focus on when working with organists is... Uh, is the, is the point of the beat from them playing bass because when you're playing with an organist, you have to understand that that uh, they don't have like when you're playing with a bassist and an organist. The, the difference is the basses. Somebody pulling the strings is going to have a percussive effect. Somebody playing a keyboard that has a sound going through something a Leslie that has a spinning and dispersing the sound in, in different areas and different things, you have to really be focused on your quarter note feel. And your feel has to be strong enough so that the organist will, you, you kind of compel compel the organist to, to play with you, with your beat. Wow. Because they're doing so much, the organ is like an orchestra, so they have all these different sounds and draw bars and things that they're doing. So sometimes time can be really wide. 
So you have to make sure that you develop, you, you know how to have a, a really wide time field, but at the same time, you have a really good quarter note that's distinctive that they can always sit on, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, that's that was really important. When I was really young, I worked with, um, I guess I worked with a really famous organist. I didn't even know who he was at the time because I was like 14. His name was Herbie Nix. Mm-hmm. And I can't tell you who he recorded with. I think he might have recorded with uh, Sonny Stitt. But, yeah. you know, it was just incredible. And I, I was young, I didn't know any better. But I just had a natural feeling with him because we kind of hooked up on the same thing. When you're close to the organ player, that has an effect on the sound. You can hear things better. You can feel. But I played in giant halls where the organ player is 30 feet away. Mm. And if, if there's no direct, the sound can be very, you know, it, it can be something that you can't trust. Because you just, you know, and then you may not be trusting your own beat at that. It's so important to just sit back and develop a really good pulse. And when I say that, I mean the quarter note pulse. And you don't have to play quarter note, ding, 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 but it should be everything you play, however you mix your ride cymbal thing up or your time field. That pulse is very, is very important because the organ player, if they're, if they're really good and they're listening, they will be able to always lean on you. Mm-hmm. That. Mm-hmm. That. So I, I've been fortunate, but I, look, I I always say time is time. We all have to keep our own time, but we have to be cognizant of what's going on around us. So your ears are the most important for you. And I've learned from that from playing with you know with Joey DeFrancesco for for twenty plus years and having the chance to work with Jimmy Smith and record with him, Jimmy McGriff, uh, Jack McDuff, uh, Lon, um, Dr. Lonnie Smith. Gene Ludwig, oh, yeah. uh, Charles Earl, and I played with just about all of them. And it was like they all like to hear something different, but I noticed the common thing is your groove, and you have to give it to them. You, you can't sit back and, and be, unless they suggest it, you still have to give them, the, give them the business. So be at your best. Have your ears open, have a good beat, and when they give you the space, you go ahead and you, you give it, you deliver. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's funny. Like I I, I did a, a lot of organ gigs too earlier in my in my career, and it's it's it is sort of similar to playing with a big band, which some people you know liken it to. Um, and and you know I I remember doing, and I know I I'm sure you did a bunch of these in your career, but you know different Hammond organ festivals where where you'll be playing with two or three organists at the same time and dealing with how each of them play. A, as you said, slightly different, and you got to adjust on the fly. That's man, hey, you know. <laughs> that's why it's important for us. Like, and I, this is another thing I say, and I'll say this for young musicians too. In regards to what instrument you play, it's so important to learn what came before you. Because when somebody hears you play, when I when I hear when I think of you, I said Tom, Tom went. I want to hear that the history that led before Tom went. I want to hear everything that leads up to Tom went, and I want to hear Tom went to so And your plan, I want to hear the history that led up to you and what you're bringing to to the music, you know, your contribution. And that's really important because if you do that, you have to know where you've been to know where you're going. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's 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 important, man. Um, so in, in terms of, of playing uh, with with organ players, as a drummer when when you're when you're when you're soloing in that context it's not really it's not really much different than playing with another group would you agree with that or or do you find that improvising in that setting is different uh, to me for, for me it's, it's it's been the same and of course that always depends on the music and and like you're soloing it depends on whether it's like a, whether it be an ostinato type solo right or Ebop solo or something like over over a particular form. Yep. I mean, those things come down to you. I think. With that being said, you, like us as drummers, and you you have to be able to play a lot of different types of improvisation. What what I what I mean by that is, you have to be able to play a solo like Philly, or be able to play you know a b a type form solo, where you can you know play. You have to be able to play an ostinato where you have a little bit more freedom to play with what they're doing, but you have to develop a, a concept or an idea. 
And it's also important to be able to play free by yourself when you're working on sounds and colors and dynamics, different things like that. If you have a good concept, or if you have a good understanding of those three different ways to approach soloing, you'll be fine. Yeah. And the thing is, still, even with your with with soloing and 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 uh, in, the, in the word, so to speak, you have to you have to be able to roll wherever wherever the music goes when you come back, and if things are not quite where they should be, <laughs> you have to be able to. Theme. And I think that all great musicians can do this regardless of instrument whatever. If things are kind of chaos or chaotic or out of the way or out of similar to whatever, boom, one, this is one bad. And I, I don't mean being obnoxious about it, but I mean playing it in a way where it compels everybody to just jump jump right on it. It kind of yeah. pulls everything together. Yeah. I think you have to have the ability with with that and me doing the, working with so many different or you got to be able to adjust on the fly with your time feel and with your soloing concepts and be able to listen and let the music direct you to what path you should take and that's easier said than done yeah no no totally i sticking with the with with playing with organ players for a minute i i know for me i i i learned to sort of simplify when things would get a little wonky time wise you know just as you said focusing on the pulse but also sort of trying to meet whoever that organ player is halfway but still keeping the groove happening obviously you know yeah yeah that, well that's the whole thing it's, it comes it all comes down to communication you know we have, because i don't care who it is everybody everybody has their their funny days or their not so on point days sure and the whole thing is how you how you kind of react to things when they when they don't go the way you, you plan on it. Yeah. And you have to do that in a subtle way because you're an artist and a lot of times people won't won't recognize that unless you completely panic. You know, so it's still about you know, you know, it's still about basically trying to find some common ground with the people you're working with. It's that eye contact, it's that ear contact, it's it's saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to make the one and we're not all where one is should be, or whatever. And, and doing it in a way where everybody can just lean on instead of, you know, saying, oh, this is it, you know. It's all about having, being able to communicate with people yeah. on whatever level it is. And if I, if I may go to add to that, you know, Betty Carter told me, she says, oh, forget all about trying to play stuff to, to appease musicians and, and it, you, you, you're dealing with an audience, you're dealing with people, they don't really know what you're doing technically or whatever. It's about how do you communicate to people? How do you draw them into something? They may be listening to you for a first time, listening to the mute, that type of music for the first time. You have to find a way to communicate with them or it could be on a simplistic way or, or be complex, but you still have to communicate with them, but yourselves as a band first. You with the band first, then with the audience. So, so important. Mm, yeah, it, it, it seems like jazz musicians can be so guilty of thinking that all they have to do is walk out on stage and play an amazing solo, and that's all they got to do to be great. And, you know, that's kind of part of it, but what you just said tells me that there's so much more to it. The idea of, as a group, being able to communicate with the people you are playing for and doing that, sort of meeting that group of people wherever they are. You know, if you're playing for a super hip audience that knows the music, you that's easy. You can have fun with that. But if you're playing for an audience that might have never heard it before, you know, you gotta, you have to meet them where they are, not 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 just meet the other musicians where they are, but you gotta meet the audience where they are. Would you agree? That's absolutely right. Because you gotta look at it. Music, music is a language. You know, it's it's like, uh, and we, you know, we build our vocabulary like us learning learning. Say you learn another language, you build up all this vocabulary, and basically, when you communicate with somebody, you're gonna communicate with them on their level. If I know every word in the dictionary, when I have a conversation with, with Tom Went, I'm not going to say every word in the dictionary. I'm just going to say whatever I can say so we, we can we can understand. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not going to speak to you too. I'm not going to say too much. 
because you're not going to listen to me. If I talk too loud, you're not going to listen to me. I got to communicate with you. Mm. Yeah, man, it's there's so, there's so much that goes into doing this. Sometimes it's like I laugh because it's just like being a great player of your instrument is literally just one part of it. It's where most people think it's everything. It's literally like one part, you know. So we've we've got a few minutes left. I, I, I wanted to sort of wrap up and talk about some of the things that you're working on today as a player. What are some of the things that, that, that you're sort of trying, what areas are you trying to grow in? And if you could talk to us a little bit about like what you do when you're practicing. Well, what I do when I practice, I always I like to spend a little bit of time of just loosening up, just to warm up, whatever. And that, that might be whatever, some things like combinations of uh, uh, rebounds with both hands mm. simultaneously and single as well. And just uh, just to, you know working on rolls, the real simple thing, working on being able to control the double stroke roll, play it open as well as close, being able to play it slow, you know slowly and in fast tempos. I work on playing time, you know, and regardless time and feels, you know, meaning whether it be a Latin kind of vibe, a straight ahead vibe, or whatever kind of, you know, whatever you play, a funk vibe, a rock vibe, anything. Mm -hmm. Playing that, all different kinds of tempos. I work on getting sounds out of the drums, working on colors, playing playing parts of the drums that I don't play, that I normally don't use. I may play mallets on the drums, just trying to get different sounds and seeing what I got. I try to focus on... uh, of, of uh, my, me manifesting a sound in my mind and trying to convey that through the drums, which is, mm. that's kind of deep. It's psychological, I guess, or, sure. you know, but in, I, I think about wet sounds, dry sounds, you know, mm. color sounds. I think about playing rims and playing, using the whole set. I think about that and I also like to play, spend some time on something you know you can't do or something that's difficult for you. I might play, uh, work on playing something where I gotta play nine for a while and then play 11 and then play seven and play five. Just something I know I have a hard time with and I'll do that. But definitely you, it's important that you spend a little bit of time just warming up, spend some time playing time from the slowest to the fastest, all different kinds of grooves, whether it be swing, funk, rock, Latin, play all of them. Work on playing colors, no time. Get mouths, get brush work, work on just getting sounds out of the drums. And work on playing something you know you can't play. And I listen to all kinds of music for inspiring, you know, for um, inspiration and experiences. I listen to, you know, top of, I listen to, I like uh, Alaraka and then I listen to that from a rhythmic point of view and how they break down rhythm. I like classical music. I like jazz. I like there's there's only good and bad music, That's and right. I try to get something from every type of genre, and every place that I go, I try to absorb something from their culture, whether it be the simplest thing or whatever, whatever important or what people think may not be so important. Yeah. But those things influence me, and I'm always open to what younger musicians are playing and the way that they compose because. I think that's important. I'm, I'm trying to work more on, on my reading. My reading is probably one of my weakest points. Mm-hmm. I would say being able to interpret somebody's writing, you know, because there's so many ways that you can look at that and if they had just hand you a piece, sometimes it could be a little bit overwhelming. You know, some people are really good at catching it right away and some people that may you take some time, like, okay, let's play this a while. But, you know, once you get it, you got it. So I'm, I'm trying to work on recognizing those things ahead of time in terms of reading music and interpreting people's original music. Yeah. And I'm still just trying to work on fundamentals. And those those four things I just told you, work on playing a groove, all grooves, different times, work on warming up, warming up your hands, work with, you know, your rolls and stuff like that. Work on playing something you cannot play. That's... <laughs> And find new sounds. Work on finding anything that you can find on the drum set that you can apply musically to any genre of music. 
Yeah, man, that's 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 all great advice. I know when it comes to reading, it's you know, it's it's the kind of skill like a, like a lot of skills. If you don't use it, you can lose it. So you know, working on it on your own can be really a, a beneficial thing, man. I, I I know for 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 me, I I'm always striving to get to the point where I can read something but not sound like I'm reading something, <laughs> which is hard. <laughs> That's the thing, too, you know, it's one thing that if you can interpret, if you can absorb some of it and you know how to anticipate how it's written and how the chart goes, you can play with, a more, with more of a sense of freedom as opposed to, like, looking at something and being boxed into it, you know. Yeah. Depending, yeah. I mean, if it's difficult or if you have some kind of anxiety or you got to sight read it, you know, in the Carnegie Hall or whatever the case may be, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I hear you, man. So, 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 just to wrap up, man, what what do you have coming up, man? Uh, uh, music wise, man, what's what's getting ready to happen? Uh, I'm actually going to be around for a while. Oh, cool. Um, surprisingly, you know, I had been out. I had been really busy in between July and last month. I went to to Spain. I was in Spain with a great guitarist named Chimo Tabar. I was up there with him and Pat Bianchi. Uh. And we to Spain, uh, and then I came back, and I was uh, pretty busy at home. And then I went out with Cyrus Chestnut to uh, Bogota, Colombia. Him and Cyrus Chestnut, and Mark, Mark Whitfield, and uh, Herman Bernie for uh, we did like a week and a half there. Nice. I was just in Italy uh, in late October through November, working with a friend, a great friend of mine, Massimo Ferrara, was a pianist. And Nicole and I did like maybe this was like a a lot of recording for a label at Zora Records, but it was like a lot of um, I don't want to call it jingles, but it seems like the direction of recording that's a lot of like live stream kind of things that are on the online. So man, I must have recorded like 150 tunes. Wow! I worked with it, but I've done that. And I've just I came back uh, November. When did I get back? I have to look at it to remember. Yeah, I came back uh, on the 6th, and then I did a, a recording with a guitarist named uh, Jorge um, Caraglino from Spain. And uh, I did that in, in Paramus, New Jersey, Trading Aids. And I had oh, my yeah. own gig, a band in, uh, in Philly with the great bassist from Pittsburgh, my little brother, Sam Harris. Oh, I know Sam very well. And uh, I went to, I did the um, festival the day after that in, in uh, Cape May that my, my friend Oren Evans had been curating for, uh, he's, he's on the board there, so he's been kind of curating them and helping with uh, the talent that they bring in in the, in the groups. So I was there with a great young vibraphonist from there named Ben Galise. Oh, yeah. Great. And Brian Betts and me and Pat Bianchi. And I was, uh, I've been working with, I did a couple gigs with uh, Joe Magnarelli. And Akiko Saruga, I've been working with a lot. She's a great young organist from mm -hmm. uh, and who's uh, been getting a lot of uh, credibility and a lot of attention paid to her, rightfully so. She's great. I recorded a record with her about a year, almost a year ago. It should be coming out, but I have some future work coming up with her. We have uh, we're going to be in Switzerland in February, and we're also going to be in. I think we're going to be at the Florida State University or. Florida State or the University of Florida. Beautiful, man. I've been, doing, I've been working with a singer with Ruth Naomi Floyd, and I work with some young guys, uh, you know, in Philly recently, a great young tenor player, uh, and piano combos like uh, Joe Block is the pianist and Dylan Band is a tenor saxophonist with a great young singer who's in New York now. His name is uh, Ty Tyreek McDowell. Mm. He, I think he won the, the Sarah Vine thing. He's Sarah Vine competition. And uh, I think he's like the first male or the second male to win that. But this wow. is the kids. Honey Hartman and Joe Williams and everybody wrapped up in one. And he had his own thing, too. He plays trumpet and writes music. So it's like, wow. I've been blessed to get these gigs with all these different people. That's wonderful, <laughs> Ben. Coming up, Alex Claffey and, and uh, yeah. Benny Benack, the third. I got oh, yeah. Stuff. Yeah, I know you know him. <laughs> so, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, so it would be nice to just uh, 
try to get caught up on what's happening here and try to work on some stuff. Uh, just playing a little bit and keeping myself on top and, and trying to work on recording some music or, or better yet, writing some music or coming up with some concepts. Man, so. beautiful. Man, that's that's great. It's it's it makes my makes my day to know that those younger guys are are calling you, man. That's that's really great. That's that's how it should be. And exactly, man. And and you know, they appreciate. I don't take them for granted. And they don't. And, and I'm fortunate that a lot of them that I they don't take me for granted either. Oh yeah. Even in, when I go to New York, it's guys that know me, young guys that know me. I wouldn't expect to know me. And I'm like, oh, okay. I have to say to everybody, even if I don't, if I don't remember them, I have to say, oh yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, man. I hear you. Man, well, you know, th- thank you so much for taking the time out of your out of your schedule to uh, to talk, man. It's it's such a pleasure, man. I've I've loved your playing for so many years, and it's been such an honor to to get to know you, man. And I hope we can hope we can collaborate in in some different ways in the future, man. So always my pleasure, Tom. And I, man, I love your playing as well. You you're special. You're special oh, to you, your community, and you're special to this, this drummer and this whole music scene. Yeah, and man. I love what you do podcast man anytime brother anytime anything i could do let me know and that is it for episode 11 thank you for listening please like share subscribe give us a five-star rating write some words into the review space on spotify or apple Podcasts or google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcast we appreciate you um, also a reminder we have drum candy t-shirts for sale on drum factor direct also there is the carter mclean Masterclass coming up here at the end of april that's april 28th you can get tickets at eventbrite just search carter mclean Masterclass. that is in partnership between drum factor direct drum candy podcast uh, the pennsylvania chapter of percussive art society and hosted over at hawthorne drum shop that's april 28th with carter mclean go get your tickets at eventbrite till next time have a good one see you then